You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Welcome back, everybody, to Experiencing Data. I'm uh, really happy to have Nancy Duarte on the line. Nancy, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to uh, to sh- share your wealth of knowledge about presenting information and helping people encourage uh, others to make decisions, persu- <laughs> persuading people to get what you want in some ways, but also to help them understand the the findings in your own work. Uh, when you find uh, nuggets with data and you, you're excited about the potential for those, how do you get other people to uh, buy into your vision? And so you are a communication expert. You've, you've worked with Fortune, Time Magazine, Forbes, Fast Company, a whole bunch of great names that, that everyone here will know. And you, you've written a bunch of books and your TEDx talk has over a million views. And so you, you clearly know a ton about this space. But for those that don't know Nancy's uh, name, Nancy Duarte, she's also the CEO of Duarte Inc., uh, which is uh, the largest design firm in Silicon Valley. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you're, you're running a large uh, design communications company uh, there, and, and you're, just, you're really an expert in this space. So I'm really happy to have you on the show. But now that I've kind of said all your bio-like stuff for you, <laughs> tell our listeners how you like to be uh, thought of and and what what's the kind of substance that you like to share with the world, your mission? Well, outside of being a grandma, which I love, <laughs> um, you know what we there, communication's a mess, really. I mean, if you think about uh, think about it, and so what we're trying to do is help everyone communicate their best, whether that's through data, through technology, um, and a lot through the spoken word. So if you think about the spoken word and its power and there's, it's really hard to find even an impassioned plea to a movement that didn't start with somebody saying and sharing the spoken word. And so it's kind of an honor to be mostly spoken word experts. And we're getting more into the writing of the spoken word and the written word and just how you communicate is just so important today to be clear and be brief and help others understand what you're trying to say. So that's what we focus on. We'll do everything from the communication plan all the way through to, you know, all the moments in time where you need to communicate to make sure that your initiative or your company or what your, or your project is going really, really well. Mm-hmm. So this word gets tossed around a lot. I mean, every freaking job application that I, you know, when I was an employee, it's like good communication skills. <laughs> it's like must breathe oxygen, you know, like that's the only kind of thing you can breathe here. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. So yeah. tell me what, what are the identifiers? Uh, what would be the symptoms of perhaps someone working and, you know, our audience here on, on this show is data scientists and analytics leaders, technical product managers, If you think everything is just fine (laughs) about your own skill in in this area to communicate, what might be some of the the biases that you don't know that you have that may may actually be problematic? I love that question. Yeah, there's um, statistics that state that the more uh, technical and specifically the data uh, analyst roles have a bigger gap in resumes that even say that they're strong at communication. So there's a, a higher demand for communication skills when you're in a particularly more analytical type of role. And I, the biggest thing that happens in communication across the board, regardless of the actual title or you know whether what kind of role they're in, is a lack of empathy. You know, especially technical people, analytical people, they become subject matter experts in their own field. They become deep thinkers in their own field. So when you need to communicate to someone else, whether it's whether it's your peer or above you or to a broader audience, like an all hands meeting, people forget to pause and say, I know what I know. I don't know what they don't know. And really take a walk in the shoes of your audience and really think about, well, how does this person communicate? Do I need to even present or can it be in an email? Or, or, or if you get an audience with them in person, take a moment to think through how you need to modify what you're trying to communicate so they understand it. Because you can communicate all day long, but if you don't empathetically understand how they receive information, it, there's going to be a miss. It's just not 
they're not going to get what you're either asking them to do or you're asking them to approve what they're, you're asking them to fund. None of that. It'll just, it'll just blow past them and waste everyone's time. So empathy is the big missing ingredient in almost every role. Sure. And we, this, we tossed this words probably, and if we had a word cloud for the show, this word would be one of the ones enlarged. Oh, wow. Probably. That's incredible. <laughs> so wow. we talk about this a lot, but do you think the, like it, on a practical, like day-to-day level for someone who's doing work with data, they're, they're highly technically skilled. And then, you know, let's say maybe 10% of the time they're going out and presenting an artifact that either is communicated visually or verbally or a combination of the two uh, is, for example, what are some of those symptoms that it's not going well? Could it be like a, no one's asking any questions and you have blank <laughs> stares from the audience or B like, I, I'm trying to help someone understand like, wow, maybe I'm not so good at this and there's actually something to this, but I want, you know, I'm trying to help them help our audience see like, what would make me want to go work on this? Yeah. Like, or, or I, I had this great idea. I'm so sure we should do it this way. And they're like, no, we're going to go keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the biggest struggle for analysts is they see a lot of data, they go through lots of data sets, and then they have to compile their findings from the data. And sometimes you find these clever little bits in different places, and then you have a hard time knowing what to cut. So sometimes I feel like they put in the whole um, the whole kitchen sink and more. And, yeah. and part of the role of an analyst is when you hit a data set, really, really what happens is one of two things. You either find an opportunity or you find a problem in that you find a problem that needs to be solved that the data is pointing to. So mm-hmm. the minute you're done digging through the data and you found a problem or opportunity, now you have a communication problem because now you got to get other people to see the pr- same problem that you're seeing that the data is pointing to. And then a lot of times you can stay the analyst or you can form a point of view and say, if this is what I found that's a problem, therefore we need to what? And you move from being an analyst to becoming a trusted advisor, a strategic advisor, when you mm-hmm. actually will form a point of view of what needs to happen because of the data. So I think you used an um, off-the-cuff statistic saying oh, 10% might present. And I I would say that it it, it's that was a guess, by the yeah, way. Yeah, right. No, and no data it was back awesome. I, just... I love data. Data like that. I form all kinds of data like that all the time. But it is interesting <laughs> that even when even when you someone requests data from you and all you're doing is sending it back, most data analysts have an opinion. They just don't feel that it's their job to share that what the problem or the opportunity they've seen in the data. So there's always, always, when you're sending someone data, pointing out an observation at the smallest or pointing out an action that should happen from the data, there's a lot more opportunity, I think, for that role than they give themselves credit for because they see it. They see it. They just feel like it's not their job to communicate it. And would you say that the majority of the time it's, I, so I see this manifestation in and technical data products and analytics tools mm-hmm. and decision support applications where there's a tendency, you know, when designers are not involved in this, the tendency is to err on the side of delivering tons of yeah. detail uh, up yeah. front, thinking that, well, we can't be sure, you know, we have some monitoring tool that like looks for something widget that breaks in the assembly line. And so we're gonna give you all the telemetry <laughs> because we're not actually sure you know, we have an mm-hmm. estimate about why this thing broke and here's the proof. No, instead it's like, here's everything because then that way we're clean. We're like we're, we have mm-hmm. no responsibility if something's wrong. And I'm like, well, if no one actually will use this tool to do anything with it now because it's information overload, then what value did you really bring? You didn't, the, the quantity does not exactly. uh, help you provide the value. So can you talk about that mm-hmm. like balancing of, detail. And, and you went into this in your book, which I yeah. thought was really good. Talk about these uh, slide uh, handouts. And so you have your verbal, you have your presentation to accompany your verbal delivery of the information, but you also have these things called slide docs, which are mm-hmm. kind of in the PowerPoint format, but they're intended to be right. read. And, mm-hmm. and I think this is a place where a lot of times I see presentations that are effectively slide docs that are being 
read. You know, there's way too many words on the slides and they need to be read. You know, you can't read and listen at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's you're only doing it's one. interesting. I asked, uh, we did a survey. We work with really incredibly high performing brands and, and I have 140 people. We just build presentations all day. And what was interesting is I surveyed our customers, about 85% of them actually circulated their decks as something to be read, which means the verbal dialogue you may use just they don't know what it is. It just travels around with the help of a presenter. And I found that those were critical in communicating within cultures is how much information wound up being in these internal facing documents. Um, we call them uh, slide docs. What happens though is at the very beginning of your slide doc, you need to make sure you have a very clear narrative arc. It might be three slides, could be 20 slides, but you take a brief, you make it into a briefing. And these, um, we have at slidedocs.com, I put some really beautiful templates with beautiful typesetting. So you could use a really nice design base to start building slide docs from. And what you need to do is, is create a narrative arc with a structure, which data story gets into how to structure it. Have that be brief and tight and clear. And then you can put a freaking appendix in there. That appendix can be 200, 400 pages. Like put everything you think in there, but call it an appendix. Like don't stick it in the front. Like don't co-mingle your backup data with the message you're trying to convey from the data. And that'll right there, just calling an appendix and sticking only the most important things there, but things that don't clutter the actual message from the data is a great place to start for clarity's sake. Yeah, so I, I think the and by the way, we're we're referring to your latest book. It's called Data Story, and that's that's the one I've been uh, checking out most recently. And I, I, it sounds like the the summary advice there, if I can play it back to you, is that you know for for the data science or uh, you know analytics type of person, you're probably really good at the appendix piece, <laughs> and it's the brief piece that you exactly. need to work on. So think about how you <laughs> condense that down. Uh, you know, taking an opinion on something, ha- having a story. Uh, to tell about that information and and what the next steps are. I would even want, I mean, I don't know what you feel about this, but like, instead of kind of having this, and I understand this, I understand the science side of trying to remain extremely objective and how you approach the work, but in a business context, the, the goal is not to do perfect research most of the time. Yeah, it's actually to probably help inform someone else's decision making. So I think the rigor goes into the 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 process that you used. But if you think about the, I don't know, thinking about the presentation as not so much about the rigor, but like debrief the information, debrief, briefing being the word there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, consolidate it down. Don't be afraid to cast your uh, opinion about what it means and what the story is there, even if that's not necessarily what, you know, the ultimate decision isn't made based on that. I would say, you know, putting that stake in the ground, most senior stakeholders would find value in that you're not just doing this like kind of computer like work and not taking any, it's like, well, what did it mean? Like help us move forward. forward. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting to me because, you know, there's tools coming out, you know, like Tableau has some artificial intelligence. Like it could say, uh, you could put, you know, you could hit a set of data and it'll come back and say, oh, look at Jimmy's Q3 over Q3 sales are lower right? It makes what I would call an observation. What it won't ever do is say, therefore, you need to tell Jimmy to do this. It'll never say right. what action. Prescriptive. Yeah. And yeah. it won't say, oh, therefore, the data says this, so go do this action. So some say that AI will replace some of the analysis and some of the observations that you make in the data. So it is, I think, going to require more people in data to learn how to create a point of view of what needs to happen based on what they found and then articulate it really clearly. Mm hmm. So in part of your, I mean, the, the book is literally called Data Story. So I wanted you to ask us, I wanted you to tell us a story. And <laughs> what I wanted you to do is just to, is to think about one. I, I imagine you've had a chance to observe a lot of other people presenting. So I'm curious, is there one like from a data scientist or analytics leader or a product manager that totally bombed on delivery, but maybe there was like, really solid content and data there was something really solid there but the delivery either yeah. visually or uh, from the audio standpoint or not the audio but the diction and word choice yeah. and the storytelling 
it did not happen. Can you tell? Yeah, us? I was just um, reading. We we kind of collect stories of wins and failures and stuff with clients. The, the weird thing is, is I can't you know say names because <laughs> then you okay. guys will figure it out. So we work a lot with Ted Acme Corp. <laughs> Acme. <laughs> well, we work a lot with Ted, right? And the stakes are so high on the Ted stage and. There was right. a presenter who reached out to us super, we fell in love with this material. It was all based in data. A lot of the stuff that hits the TED stage, even though they try to simplify how easily it's communicated, it's based in data. We helped write his talk. We built brilliant slides. And then, you know, then we will watch them on the stage. They they sweat. They, they ruined the delivery. They didn't either, you know. Or they decided, well, I know better. I'm going to change what Duarte told us to do, and I'm going to change it. And so I just got this whole summary with a link to the talk, and I haven't had the guts to watch the guy's actual talk um, (laughs) because I was like, oh, my God. But it's so funny because if I were to rank everything, I I would have said the content is content and then delivery and then the slides. Because if you don't have good content mm-hmm. and, and a terrible delivery, you can have awesome slides and, and really everybody looks frustrated. And so that's how that's how I rank it. And and we work a lot with people who, but then you could look at the opposite, like Al Gore, right? People used to call him a dullard, that he was a terrible presenter. You're probably, and your readership or listenership's probably too young to know. They're very stiff, very uh, not credible, never came across as warm, right? And then we help with this movie, Inconvenient Truth, that has data. He's not necessarily a scientist, lots and lots of data that kind of created a movement. And so you there's someone who actually worked on the delivery skills, gained in credibility. Now he's considered a fantastic presenter, but never was before. So I think if I think that helped him actually that he'd worked on his actual delivery skills. So uh, on this topic of communication skills, um, you know, I'm sure all of our listeners are familiar with the, the STEM education and there's also STEAM education with the A. <laughs> Uh, which kind of refers to the arts yeah. and, and humanities. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I've had other, uh, you know, leaders in, in, in the space that we focus on talking about the value of uh, liberal arts education, humanities education, in part because it, it, it helps develop some of these skills that are non-technical and non-analytical. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, do you think that a lack of arts in the schools and uh, from an early age is, is part partly to do with why some of this is not doesn't come as naturally to some people is that we're not developing maybe it's seen as fluff I, I always kind of think you know if people can't draw a direct line from what art class or band or whatever does for you then it's like it's the first thing that gets <laughs> cut right and then we complain on the back end mm-hmm. when people are professional about why can't they talk to us and I have no idea what this guy does all day but they cost a lot of money and there's like PhD like what the hell <laughs> That's so funny. Well, you know, the arts, it's so funny because the arts, you know, you, you, you say band, you say art and all those things. So, so many you, in in music, you learn systems thinking, you learn community, you learn how to communicate with each other. Liberal arts, you learn history, you learn how to write, you learn creative writing. And I, it's so funny. I had a gal who I really admire who's a data science and this all day long programming charts in R and super respected in the startup community. And so I asked her, I said, well, look at, look at this program and tell me what you think. And she's just like, cause she's from Europe and there you, you almost kind of pick your major and you stay only in your lane. And she said, I, I never even knew the parts of speech and it, I, all of it was new. And she's close to 40. Like she did not even know that there's a certain way to construct this. And that's how narrow her education was. So she's like, oh, you just don't learn how to communicate. And now that's going to be the number one demand for this role is to be a communicator. So I agree with adding the A there. And some people think art means art class, like, right, right. Well. but it's all of the arts, obviously, right? It's the history, the writing, the creative thinking, all of that stuff. It's, we've gone so heavily rewarded the analytical mindset that now we can't back out of that and be dual modal about being an analytical mindset and then also really having a discipline around a creative mindset. And to me, communicating and crafting and and really shaping a piece of communication is actually a creative skill, not an analytical one. And what I've tried to do is make it as far analytical structurally as possible, where there's actual kind of almost like a formula you could use when you go to communicate data, just to remove some of the mystery around the process, but it's still creative in nature. Yeah, and w- one of the things that stood out to me when I was going through data story in this book is that 
you know, for for all the, our our math nerds and in, uh, in the audience, and I say that with love, is that um, there's science and analytics built into the proof that's in the pudding about the three act model that you talk about. And I think it was at mm-hmm. Vonnegut that it asked for a study of the mm-hmm. story structures. And so you guys, they went out and did a study of like the narrative structures to look for these patterns. And so if you want the data to prove that this isn't fluffy, <laughs> it's actually <laughs> in that. the book. So yeah. it's really cool that there's like, you know, kind of analytics and data to back up what may seem like very qualitative you know what this is what nancy thinks you know (laughs) yeah there's brain science yeah lots of brain sciences talk about some of those those uh findings yeah i mean now that we can hook up fmri machines to the brain while a story is being told there there's incredible findings that the brain performs differently when a story is being told um than almost any other communication medium so what will happen is if i'm i'm the storyteller you're the story listeners our brains will sync up they'll actually fire in the same order, which means there's something really powerful happening in the human brain. It also lights up the sensory, all of the sensory brain. And the other thing that's interesting is is your critical mind, like your judgmental nature will suspend while a story is being told and you're open to alternate ideas. So that applies like in business where like, I'm so entrenched in the way I work and what I believe for my department, we're not as open sometimes to change. And this uh, as a tool is used incredibly and enormously through change. And the study that you were talking about was done by the Computational Story Lab and they fed in the entire library of the Gutenberg Project, which is every fiction book been written that's in the public domain practically. And they uh, fed it in and looked at the arc, the emotional arc, the rise and fall of emotion during a story. And they did find that it's finite. There are six types of arcs. And so I took those six arcs and applied it to um, data and its arc and how it how it kind of rolls. So you're right. I mean, in the three act structures, timeless all the way back to Aristotle. So nothing in here is really my opinion. I just applied it as a communication device. I applied story as a communication device over data so that you could shape it in a way that people will receive information and their brain will light up when you talk to them, <laughs> which is cool. <laughs> well, it's, and it's, it's, it's pretty meta the, the way you did that because you're in a way maybe not even in a way, literally your you, there's a bunch of analysis that was done in this case, maybe you weren't doing the primary analysis, but you took quantitative data to back up a story about how to tell stories. And so you're kind of, as we call it <laughs> dog fooding on the show, you're dog fooding your own stuff. And I think that's really powerful. And, and I think, you know, the more analytical people in the audience can maybe will recognize that that's going yeah. on. I, I think that's fantastic. It's like the movie Inception, but right. with data. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? You're listening to Experiencing Data, the podcast that explores how design and user experience make enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. Your host is Brian O'Neill of Designing for Analytics, designer, UX consultant, and advisor to the business leaders behind custom enterprise data products and analytics applications. For more information, visit designingforanalytics.com. If you're enjoying the show, help Brian out by rating it on iTunes. And now, back to Brian. I'm going to be selfish for a second and ask a question that I sure. that I want to know about that I care about for me. And most of the time, I try to think about what my my listeners care about. But so, and and maybe they can relate to this too. So, uh, a lot of the speaking uh, that happens can be in the context of things like conferences. And conferences have this mm-hmm. weird chicken and egg problem, which is uh, you propose a talk on some some subject with a broad understanding of who's attending the conference but they don't know who's attending the conference because no one's bought a ticket yet. They don't have the teacher, (laughs) the speakers picked. And so you end up coming into this room with no idea who your audience is. Like, and for me, this is constantly a challenge. And I'm I'm curious, do you have any strategies besides kind of trying to survey the audience with raise your hand if you're a product manager, raise your hand if you're this and try to steer your thing in the last minute, right? You're, You're like ready to give it. Any, what, what are some strategies when you walk into not really knowing who that audience is at the level? And maybe this is, I'm worried, I'm slicing that's too thin, but what do you think about that? 
Well, if I don't, um, mm-hmm. so usually what I uh, what I do is I speak probably at maybe more already established conferences, so maybe they know more. But usually I have a conversation as close or an email exchange as close as I can to the date itself to find out what the profile wound up being of the attendees, mm-hmm. if they can tell mm-hmm. that. If they can't tell that, I'm always there a little bit early and will uh, try to talk to the people in the audience. So what happens at a conference is if they have a choice between say your a description of your session and they have a choice between yours and someone else they clearly saw something in your overview of what you're going to talk about to choose you over someone else so it's too late at that point to change any of your content but what i can do is i could wrap it a little bit more. Like if if i got there and realized oh these are more technologists than data people or these are well more sales people than marketing people i can actually nuance the talk with my narrative and not have to necessarily do something with my slides because you always want them to empathetically connect to why you're saying what you're saying so the benefits you could wrap the benefits verbally around what you're trying to um share but that's a tough one i try to have a pre-consult or a call with whoever asked me to come in because they collect a lot of attendee data. Mm -hmm. They collect a ton of it. But finding out why someone chose your course, that can be done with just quick conversations. I try to like sprinkle across the audience um, and figure that out. But you can also, obviously, like you're saying, a show of hands is sometimes faster than getting them to do a poll or anything like that. But I don't, I don't think it hurts to, to have a quick show of hands. I just don't know that there's any other way to solve that without having to open up a digital tool. Sure, sure. And that's, I, I wasn't talking about making any type of slide change at that point, but just, and I actually do the same thing. It's too late, it's some of the right? best conversations yeah. you have are just when people show up early and, and you're, you know, you're hanging out by the podium. Because they're enthused to be yeah, there. Yeah, you yeah. go figure out what's, what someone's headspace is at and, and where you can meet them and hopefully, you know, push mm-hmm. them in the right direction with something you have to share. So, yeah. So the there's this topic, uh, a, a thing you guys have created, uh, a model called the data POV point of view. So what is that in, mm-hmm. in data story? Yeah. So what happens is if you're digging through the data, you do you start to synthesize it, and you do you do wind up with a point of view. And what that usually is is what is the problem I've identified because of the data, and what's the opportunity I identified because I dug through the data. There's a problem or an opportunity, and what you do is you shape that into your point of view. So a point of view has two components to it. It's like what's the problem or opportunity I found, and what's at stake if we do or do not do that. So when you when you state what the problem or opportunity is, you also have to state a verb. Here's the problem. Therefore, we need to do blah. What you're trying to do is figure out what are the actions we take to make the data go the direction we want it to. So most data is created by a human or a cell or something that can anthropomorphically, (laughs) I'm really screwing up that word, they can be anthropomorphized into something that's kind of human. So they leave this data exhaust, like they leave this little trail of data. Humans usually generate that data. That means that if a human changes behavior, it would impact the future data. And so what you're doing is you're trying to say, hey, here's the problem or the opportunity I found in the data. Therefore, we need the humans to start to do this other action so that we can transform the data. If they do do it, this is great. If they don't do it, it's terrible. So it's this lockup of your point of view plus what's at stake. That was a long definition, but it literally as easy as that. Here's my my point of view about the data is, and then you state your point of view, and then you say what's at stake to do or do not do that action mm-hmm. that you're asking them to do. Mm-hmm. The, do you have any, uh, I don't know if you ever model this this way, this type of uh, observation in the wild with people working on presentations, but I know that one area that, is sometimes a struggle, especially in the data science world with, with machine learning algorithms and predictive technologies is the, is the precision about recommendations and predictability versus Mm -hmm. making some progress in the right direction. And it's like, Uh well, is a 58% probability that a prediction is correct enough to go to the business and say, we should change our what you know our CRM sales funnel whatever it is because of this fifty eight percent thing, and they're feeling like well I'm not whose whose job is it to decide fifty eight percent is enough or not 
I'm going to retreat into my object, my objective scientific <laughs> thing, which is it's 58 percent, <laughs> and whatever you guys want to do is fine. I have another project coming up. You know, can you talk to me about yeah, that precision funny. versus you know um, taking that stand, especially when 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 we can't be. Per- and I'm always like, hey, dear data scientist, you're not God. You're not going to predict the future perfectly. You're, perfectly. Even your 99% yeah. thing could be wrong. So just if you just accept that for a second, that it will never actually predict the future perfectly all the time, mm-hmm. then we're already living in this gray space, right? <laughs> right. I love, so, love where you're so going. Tell, this talk was, to me about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so funny because we, we built, uh, I built the course and then the book, and it was so interesting to see. We, we built a case where a, a, a piece of the answer is just completely missing, and you'll never know. Therefore, you have to kind of guess, but you have plenty of data. And it is so crazy how people absolutely want there to be a right and a wrong answer. And I left it ambiguous on purpose. Because what has to happen is as you stay in business longer and longer and longer, and, and you, I'm sure you've developed this, Brian, you have to develop an intuition, a sense of intuition. Best business decision I ever made, the data would have told me to do something different. This goes into that part where AI can never replace this part of this job, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. An expert would need to know at 58% probability, do we move forward or do we not? It will never tell you your exact destination, but data will tell you at least the rough hemisphere to head into, right? At 58%, the answer there might be, let's give it one more quarter of data. At 58%, it might be, oh my God, that's enough to be, we're already behind our competitors and we need to dive in. This is where context comes into place. And also intuition, because I can make a data, I can make a decision on data when it's less than 40%. And, and because I've been doing this for 30 some years, I've been looking at my industry data, I've been looking at my data, I can jump on things that my, other people might not. So that's when you become that strategic advisor, I was saying, you move away from just being an analyst to being an advisor because you have so well read, you have context, you understand the industry, you understand markets, you understand models. And that's when you marry intuition with data and not everyone can do it not everyone has the guts to do it because like you said (laughs) you're gonna be wrong probability Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who want everything to be perfect and start line perfect here and they won't move forward and real life and business does not work that way um so yeah you're on the same page there dude yeah exactly (laughs) where i'm at i think until you like i don't know if you noticed this just as your career moved and you you move into this leadership position that a lot of leaders are making a lot, if not most of the decisions based on these intuitions. And and now Mm -hmm. we're wanting to use data more to do this, but none of us know the, like, wow, should we open this plant or not? hundred thousand employees, it's a multi-billion dollar investment. And it comes down to this, you know, this CEO (laughs) to decide yes or no, you know, it's someone's decision. Right. And Uh there's no, there's no report that says, yep, you should do it. There's a bunch of supporting right. data, but there's also all this intuition and other stuff that goes into it. And mm-hmm. so I think just to, learning to accept that the ambiguity is part of that human experience. Even but I think, this, like, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's why so many people resist change, right? Because they could look at me and be like, Nancy's an idiot. Did she not see this one itty bitty tiny narrow piece of data I look at all day? Well, I have to look at that person's little bitty bit of data in the context of a whole bunch right. of other data sets, you know? And so I think people can entrench themselves because of data. I think data actually slows down our decisions or emboldens someone to be against an idea. Because, I mean, you see it in politics, right? One, you know, the president, all presence, they look at one data set that makes them look good and other people will look at a different data set Mm -hmm. that might, you know, and so you see it happen all the time. And so I just think it's fascinating that data is going to help us incredibly, but then it also, I think in some ways, um, hinders forward progress because of exactly the point you're making. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, is there one piece of advice you might've given to yourself if, if you could redo something from like 20 years ago, perhaps around data or how you approach using it in your work or anything like what would you what would you have done differently that's a good question you know i've had to really get way more involved in the finance and the data it's amazing 140 person firm i had an analyst i had business intelligence tools to pay 35 grand a year just for the tools themselves like i never ever would have imagined how much it would cost me to just have access to the data. Mm -hmm. Considering in my long history, 31 years I've been running this business. I mean, it's only been in the last eight, nine. I've always had data in a really simple database, but now I'm having, it's almost like 
<laughs> what happens at my deck table will say, we would maybe talk about a topic and then we would be ready to move forward. And inevitably someone will say, can we get any data to support the right decision? I'm just like, holy cow, we, we were at a decision and now you want data to support it because we have to move forward intuitively sometimes. Right. I would say to myself, actually, I, I feel like if I were to start today, I would not have the highly developed sense of intuition. So I feel like I need to be a bit more grateful for all the time I didn't have any data really at all. Hmm. And then I had a season where the data was super clear and accessible and very small. It was enough data to get me just the right amount of a level of insight. And now I'm swimming in it. And that's one of the reasons here I am, had to write a whole book about it. My clients are drowning in it. We work with, I mean, we work with like, I think 35 of the top 50 brands in the, in the fortune 500. And so it's like, they're dying. They don't know what to do with it. I just, I just feel like, wow, it, 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 it's important now and it's more important than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And I've had to become better. At, I spend more time in Excel than I dreamed I would and more time looking at my dashboard and stuff. Than ever dreamed I'd have to. So it's becoming a, a competitive differentiator and you need data now to turn instantly on a dime. Just instantly, I need to change my decision based on data outcomes. And it never used to be that way. So I think I'm having, I'm having to swing from mostly an intuitive leader to a completely data-driven one. Yeah, no, I can, I can understand that. It's the, it's the theory that, that all this data is going to help us make all these better decisions, but there's this like giant tax that also comes with it. And, you uh -huh. know, and this is where, again, the storytelling and, and design can help us actually, you know, put these raw ingredients to, to better use and help us make those decisions. Cause ultimately, you know, as we talk about for, in the context of building data products and, and applications, things like this, it's it's really about decision support. That that's the outcome that you're going for. And the you know, the output is your code and your model, your your software application. But if it doesn't produce meaningful decision support, then you didn't do anything. The data the data is just sitting there and it's not actually activating. Exactly. Uh, and, and we want to activate for outcomes as much as possible. But Hard, yeah. Harder said than done. So, <laughs> yeah, I like how you said that. It's just sitting there and not activating. Yeah, I love that line. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, we've been talking to Nancy uh, Duarte here about her latest book called uh, Data Story and and your experiences uh, helping people learn how to be better communicators. So, just as we kind of wrap this up, I'm I'm curious. I, it's it's hard to distill an entire book or 31 years of experience down into a couple sentences. But for for our audience, are there any like kind of parting words you would use in terms of advice or if they were to move from inaction to just taking a first step towards like getting better at this, what, what would that be? Um, I, I mean, I think obviously lead with empathy. And to me, story is the gateway drug to empathy. So mm -hmm. I, I do think becoming a student of story, it is a structure. It's almost mathematical in nature. And it's, I mean, it's, it's proven. So I would say, you know, really understand empathy become a bit of a student of a story. And when you start to apply these, you'll see a lot of traction around your ideas. Cool. Well, thank you and for sharing that. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to ask you a question. I, I was watching your TED talk. Do you know what a, <laughs> yeah. square, a square wave is in music? A square wave? There's, yeah, there are different audio profiles of waves. There's like a sine wave and, and they translate to huh. a certain kind of sound. But anyhow, the story arc in your TED talk that you draw, which is like, you know, flat line and then vertically goes up, yeah. and then flat line, vertically down. That's called yeah. square waves. And I was just curious if you'd heard oh about that. So now you you know what I did? My son <laughs> in the, the last section of the actual book, I called it a coda, which is a musical term. Uh -huh. And in there online, you can find, I had my son analyze music, classical music. He's a classical composer. So he analyzed it and actually took the sonata form from Mozart and Beethoven and analyzed it to the shape of that form. It's really beautiful. Oh, a lot of people awesome. see a musical um, music in it. So that's cool. I love that. Yeah, yeah, no. So a lot of the the sonata form would uh, definitely translate well. So that's that's great. That's very cool. Cool. Well, how can people find out of, uh, about your work and where should where should they find you? Are you LinkedIn or awesome. Twitter? Where do you yeah. where do you hang out? Online? Our company website is Duarte.com. I'm up on Twitter, Facebook, pretty active on LinkedIn. I connect to anyone uh, who connects me up there. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, I think you can find me on uh, almost all the social channels, except I'm way behind on Instagram, but I'll come out on that soon. Cool. All right. Well, I'm, I will definitely put a, a link to those things and Thank to your you. new book, Data Story. I, I definitely re uh, recommend people check that out if you're doing anything to do with presentations, uh, either visually produce, you know, producing handwritten assets uh, to, to give out a debriefs 
things like this. Um, def- definitely a good read. So thanks for coming on Experiencing Data and, and sharing with us. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.